Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, seminar on European Union opt-outs with Professor Rebecca Adler Nissen from the University of Copenhagen. My name is Kristin Haugvik. I am a research fellow here at NUPI and I'm also a participant in two ongoing projects here at NUPI to which this seminar is linked. The first of these projects is the research project Europe in Transition, EU Nord, which is financed by the Norwegian Research Council. And the second project is the seminar series Norway Meets Europe, which is funded by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, before we proceed to today's interesting topic and our excellent guest, let me just take the opportunity to briefly inform you about a few practicalities. Firstly, I would like to inform you that this seminar is being streamed online on NUPI's YouTube channel. Secondly, uh, please note that the emergency exit is through that door, uh, and in the case of an emergency situ situation, which is not likely, but if it should happen, we should use the stairs rather than the elevators to get down to the ground floor. And finally, should anyone need to use the toilet during this seminar? I hope not, but, but um, if they are, it's through the glass door in the reception and on the left-hand side of the corridor. Okay, so having said that, let us now turn to the seminar today. Rebecca Adlenissen is, I think we can say, a long-standing friend of NUPI. Uh, she has been a guest here at the Institute several times, and she has also been a participant in several of our research projects the last few years. She is a professor at the University of uh, Copenhagen at the Department of Political Science, where she has worked for several years now. And she has worked and published on a range of issues, including international relations theory, diplomacy, sovereignty, and European integration. She has won a number of prizes for her research, including the Norwegian Nils Klim Prize last year. And she has a long and impressive publication list. Uh, she has published, pu published articles and books in some of the best academic journals and publishers in our field. And what I really like is that in addition, she has also found time to, time to participate in the public debate. She is frequently used as an expert in, in Danish media. She writes op-eds. She is active on Twitter, and she frequently gives seminars such as the present. Today, uh, Rebecca is going to talk about an issue that she has worked with a lot during her career, uh, namely how many European states have responded to the European integration process by negotiating so-called opt-outs. This was the topic of her PhD research, uh, which was published in book format at Cambridge University Press in 2014. It looks like this. It's a brilliant book, which I strongly encourage you to, to go out and take a closer look at. In her book, Rebecca asks whether opt-outs can be most fruitfully seen as a way of opposing the idea of European integration, um, as integration process, or if they should rather be seen as a pragmatic way of integrating states as evidence of the EU's sui generis nature. And I think today that she will argue here that opt-outs have actually reinforced the European integration process. And the topic, of course, is as relevant as ever now that we have the result of the British referendum um, process. And today, Rebecca is going to talk about the British case, but she is also going to talk about Denmark, which, of course, is also a highly interesting case in this uh, context, and not least for us Norwegians. We will have plenty of time, I hope, for questions afterwards. Um, and Rebecca, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, thank you for that warm welcome. It feels good to be uh, back home here at NUPI, uh, which has probably been the most uh, kind of continuous uh, place to where I could always go and get some, some good feedback or, or uh, some, uh, some good times. So it's really nice to be here. Um, as uh, Kristin was saying, uh, this is going to be a talk about my book, but it's also going to be a talk about, I think, what occupies us all a little bit, what is going on, <laughs> and what will happen with Brexit, with other states, uh, uh, including maybe Norway. Uh, as as the, the months go by, we realize perhaps that uh, this is ever uh, more important to actually understand how this process uh, takes place. So I'm really happy to, to be here. And um, 
the first question we might ask ourselves these days is um, the following. Um, how are we to make sense of Brexit? Um, is it, as some would say, well, in my field at least, that it's a question of uh, basically uh, looking at the structure of international relations, saying, okay, well, Brexit, uh, Britain leaves at some point, then we can calculate uh, somehow the bargaining power of the EU that's left, the EU 27, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US, China, etc. We can look at the kind of role that the UK will now have, a diminished role in the world. Um, and then from there, we might actually also look at the uh, bargaining process, looking at whether or not we end up with a hot Brexit, as some would say, or a soft one. That's one very common way of doing it. But I think we need to zoom in. Um, and uh, a lot of people would agree with me. So rather than just looking at it from a global perspective, although that is important, um, just two days ago, the Japanese ambassador in Copenhagen came to my office and tried to explain why Japan is so scared about the prospects of Brexit, <coughs> exactly because Britain is the pathway for Japan into the internal market. But maybe we should go into the UK, that is, look at the discursive struggles that actually made many people believe that if they voted to leave, they could stop immigration, not only from EU member states, from, but from third world countries uh, or third countries uh, to the UK. Um, how was UK able to convince a lot of people about that? So that would be another option. But <laughs> I think we should look even closer. Um, we should zoom in on this building and uh, Justus Lipsius, this is where Brexit will actually be negotiated. This is where we will know whether or not it becomes a soft, uh, medium, <laughs> or a hard Brexit. Uh, this is Brussels, where the member states um, meet every single day, and what I in the book call the engine room of European integration. And then we should look at the Prime Minister, Theresa May, who has said the famous Brexit means Brexit. Enigmatic three words that will probably be what she will be most known for in history uh, whenever we are going to write history books. But she has now added the very important, and we are going to make a success out of it. So uh, this performative statement, uh, we are still uh, very excited to see what, 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 what kind of success that will be. But in my book and in my work in general, I think we should actually zoom in uh, a little bit more to this guy. Uh, we could call him James. I haven't been able to identify him. Um, he is, I think, a long-standing, uh, uh, he has a, wear, wears a blue badge, so he actually has access to most of the uh, levels in the Council of Ministers. And let's say he's a, the close advisor to, to Theresa May. Um, for him, Brexit will be a very personal experience. He has maybe worked for 30 years uh, for his country and for the EU, and for him, the two things hang together. He can't separate those two things. Promoting British interests in Brussels is being active in Brussels. Um, and for him, Brexit will be uh, loss, loss of sleep. Uh, it will maybe health damaging to him. He, it might cause a depression, divorce, who knows. But for him, it's going to be a very embodied experience. And that is what I'm trying to get at in this book, that we can't really understand the EU, and we can't understand all those claims for sovereignty without zooming in on those that actually have to deal with this in their everyday lives. So in the book, I asked the question, uh, which might be really simple. So we have all these member states, and some of them, in light of um, Euroscepticism, in light of uh, uh, a very difficult domestic situation, but also in light of more member states, have, 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 have demanded opt-outs, or as we say in Danish, forbehold. In Norwegian, I don't know what the word would be. Yeah. Um, so that's the first question. And then the more broad question, which I think you also alluded a little bit to, is how do these opt-outs affect European integration? And in the book, I refer to opting out as a verb rather than as a noun, because a key point here, and also in this lecture, is that opt-outs is not a choice made once and for all. It's an ongoing process that is continually 
reinterpret it. So what an opt-out meant two years ago is not the same as it means today. Um, it is an extremely ambiguous practice, opting out. Um, and what do I mean? Here's uh, what the EU says officially about opt-outs, very kind of uh, polished version here. It's basically um, a situation where you have a state that has said, well, I don't want to be part of this particular directive or this particular part of the treaty. And lots of states have that. Um, but I think in order to understand Britain's position now, Denmark's position now, the whole situation, we need to understand that these did not just emerge out of nowhere. Um, and at least we need to go back to 2005, to the rejection of the Lisbon Treaty uh, by the French and the Dutch, because I think those moments were just as important as what we're seeing now, because they were uh, mem member states from the core, as it were, um, that basically said, maybe we don't want integration to go that far. And ever since, there's been a struggle, including in my own country, where the Danish prime minister says, well, the goal, despite our opt-outs, opt we want to be in the heart of Europe. Um, but we know these opt-outs will be there. They will continue with or without Britain um, as the EU deepens. And what is it they say? What is it they claim? They're not just technical issues. Um, they basically postulate that it's possible to reclaim the state in today's world. That it's possible to say, to draw a, land, a line in the sand, legally, politically, philosophically, emotionally, say, here the state is sovereign. Um, and you heard that over and over and again, but this was a key issue in the British debate. Um, it's a key issue in the Danish debate, but it's increasingly a key issue in most member states. And of course, it's a key issue here in Norway. But what does that actually mean? What does it mean to draw that line in the sand? And can you use opt-outs for that? I'm going to argue that actually uh, to understand how European integration works, um, opt-outs can serve as a prism for understanding how deep a transformation European diplomacy is actually undergoing within this system. Um, and of course, uh, Brexit is just one example. So how did we get there? Well, we got there um, in the first place with the Maastricht Treaty. Extremely controversial, but also a different time. If, if we just think back at 1992, that's when uh, you know the Cold War was just over and we wanted a united Europe. Um, the Berlin Wall had fallen and there was this Euro enthusiasm, which is difficult to imagine these days, that everybody's, you know, this was the hour of Europe. The issue was that due to the interpretation of the Danish constitution, Denmark had to have a, have a referendum on the Maastricht Treaty. And so there was a referendum. As always with referenda, it seems, everybody thought it would be a yes. Um, indeed, the, the foreign minister said the day before to Danish TV, it's not just going to be a yes, it's going to be a yes, please. But it became a 51% no uh, and 49% voted yes. And following the referendum, there was this dream, some parties, that actually that would lead to a whole renegotiation of the treaty. Uh, but very click, quickly, it became clear that Mitterrand and the coal that you can see here um, were not that eager to open up a treaty that had been negotiated for many years, painstakingly. And so instead, it was a Danish problem. And the Danish parliament then drafted four opt-outs and gave the Danish population a chance to vote again on what is called the Edinburgh decision. This is the Edinburgh decision being decided. And uh, you got a small ma majority, just as small as the yes, almost. 57% um, voted then yes to these opt-outs with the Maastricht Treaty. But it also led to a very traumatic uh, situation, uh, namely uh, the Nuremberg night. Uh, and uh, for the first time in, in the post-Cold War era, Danish police shot into demonstrators that had created what they called a, an EU-free zone in the middle of Copenhagen, saying we don't accept the result of this referendum. Um, and that led to uh, what something that we still call the Nuremberg night, lots of investigations about police uh, behavior, but also a very traumatic experience for most Danes. And ever since, opt-out sovereignty EU has been extremely traumatic. 
So what are the opt-outs we're talking about? In the UK, um, we had actually a similar situation. There wasn't a referendum, but um, Maastricht really signaled political drama because John Major was close to, to losing um, a vote of confidence in, in Parliament because he signed what he called a, 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 a victory for Britain, Maastricht, um, but the Parliament wasn't agreeing that much. So you can see already there, it's extremely controversial. It has to do with exactly the same themes we're still debating now. Um, so on these areas, in the end, the UK and Denmark got their opt-outs. Uh, so Denmark is not part of the uh, Economic and Monetary Union, at least not the, the last part, the Euro, and it's not part of the whole uh, area of uh, visa, asylum, immigration, civil law. United Kingdom, out of Schengen, uh, and with uh, uh, increasingly uh, also out of visa, asylum, immigration, civil law. And I focus on, 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 on the Euro and Justice and Home Affairs, uh, but uh, that's because it's possible to compare the two. So what are the problems? Why can't we just assume that opt-outs, just, just read the treaty and then you know what an opt-out is. The problem is, is the following. There is an extreme, for better or worse, the EU is a legal system. But it also means that we tend to believe that when the, whatever says in the protocol uh, then it, that must probably be true. But nobody actually knows until recently how those opt-outs were interpreted politically, not just legally. Um, so there's a really a bias here. The second issue is that there's a state centrism. And this is, I think, even more paradoxical because if we know that these countries are deeply split, almost 50-50, pro, against, and actually have m many more positions, <laughs> Uh, it, it seems paradoxical to assume that there is something like a unitary state with a national interest uh, being represented in Brussels. So we want to work with a more nuanced understanding. And finally, um, it's, luck, it's very theory driven. And this comes with political science, a tendency to like big theories and grand theories and then test them like liberal intergovernmentalism, constructivism, all that. Uh, but they are loaded with ideas that we actually don't know whether or not are true in the first place. So I want to start the other way around by asking those that actually do handle European integration, how does that work? Um, and yes, we do have a very, um, a very differentiated Europe already, also before Brexit. Ireland uh, is probably the only other member state that has as many, almost as many opt-outs as Denmark and Sweden. Um, Sweden has, as you know, a de facto opt-out from the Euro uh, it has never really uh, sent that final uh, email to the commission that, yes, we are now ready. Uh, and as long as they haven't sent that email, well, then they are de facto opt out, opt out of the euro. But the British and Danish opt outs are dramatic in the sense that they send a signal, we are not going to follow you. There are less controversial opt outs. Actually, all member states have small protocols, for instance, uh, the, the Sami protocols, uh, the Finnish and the Swedish protocols that allow um, uh, the Sami people to have reindeer husbandry without the internal market competition. You know, though, though, but they're not really threatening the cohesion of the European Union. And those that have then studied this are, are usually, funny enough, lawyers. And they are very clear about this. They have theories about the normal mode and the normal mode is that everybody abide to the same rules. Um, Joseph Weiler, a wonderful constitutional scholar, uh, writes fundamentally, I'm quoting him, a flexible Europe represents an abandonment of the principle of solidarity. It endangers the whole integration process because it may inspire similar demands from other member states. This might sound very relevant in light of the Brexit discussions. Um, another fantastic legal scholar, Deidre Curtin, argues uh, even more, maybe, maybe dramatically, opt-outs, like the British and Danish ones, are a hijacking of the acquis communautaire. Um, they are basically uh, not to be there. They're destroying the union. And then there are those, often in political science, that would say, hey, take it easy. We can still live. This is a pragmatic system. Um, and actually, member states can still have influence. And can't we just find a way out um, that is more 
kind of uh, pragmatic. And I think you would find Norwegian political scientists also, uh, to some degree, having this position. The problem is they can't both be right. Either this is really, really destructive, or it's just you know a pragmatic solution to a situation where not everybody agrees. But by assuming we know already beforehand how these opt-outs work, we assume way too much. Um, and I'm going to show you how they actually do work in practice. But that requires us to go a little bit closer to Brussels, the not so beautiful capital of Europe, and, and into this building. We need to follow them when they take the flight to Brussels in the morning, um, and when they personificate the state, because that's what a diplomat basically does. Um, the state is an abstraction. It, it's only given life and meaning through people that represent it. Um, so how do British and Danish representatives actually experience this on a day-to-day -day basis? Here's uh, our former prime minister, and that's great. They're all there uh, using their uh, iPads to tweet <laughs> while they're negotiating. But we need to look at those below that level. Um, we need to look. Oops, sorry. We need to look at the um, the working group level. That's the actual everyday work, not just the prime ministers. And here's what I'm I'm claiming in the book. The first one is that actually, opt outs are not just legal protocols. They function as social stigma. Because British and Danish representatives becomes these kind of deviant uh, officials. They are not good Europeans, and this hinders them fundamentally in setting an agenda. But they don't just accept it. They also have stigma management strategies, that is, ways of dealing with this that can reduce marginalization. And this is where the ironic result is. These processes actually serve to reinstall um, the strength of the idea of European cooperation, and thus the social order in Brussels. So once you have those deviants, you're also reminded of what is actually a normal member state. OK, how do I know? <laughs> I couldn't use the theory that we usually use, so I, 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 I went to uh, political sociology, to two uh, persons that uh, I think are, or two scholars that um, really can help us understand what goes on in Brussels. Because one, uh, they're one is perhaps more interactionist, Irving Goffman, the Canadian-American sociologist. Uh, the other one's much more structuralist, French. Uh, but together, um, they're both interested in what is, we could call the very exotic everyday life um, and ex in social exclusion. And this is where we're actually getting to, to the theory. Um, and what is now also known as the practice turn in EU studies. Um, if you're interested in how I develop this more, I also have a, a, an article that came out recently trying to s set an agenda for how we could, could use these kind of theories. But the model basically is the following. We can think of the Council of Ministers, that is the member states and their representatives, as a kind of social field. It has its own rules. And in that transnational field, people develop a particular European habitus. We have to think about how many years these negotiations have been ongoing. And here, power ha happens to be a struggle to shape legislation, new projects for the EU. And in that situation, an opt-out that is an explicit no to being part of this represents a discrediting mark on national representatives. This then leads to the uh, imposition of stigma and to the management of, of stigma. So what do I mean when I say stigma? That's um, uh, Goffman's definition here. It can be used to refer to any attribute that's deeply discrediting and incongruous with our stereotype of what a given individual should be. The important thing here is there's nothing inherent in us that makes us stigmatized. You can ask any homosexuals or any minorities that uh, it's something that's socially attributed. And how do you then become stigmatized? It's a gradual process. Uh, covering these, and let me just quote from my, some of my interviews. The first one is, you're kind of labeled. So Denmark, for instance, I'm quoting a, an ambassador here from, a, a, from, from Belgium. The UK is reluctant. It's Eurosceptic, uh, or Denmark's position is absurd. Or another one saying, Denmark is a free rider. 
The second component is then when these label differences li links to stereotypes, Denmark is not solidaric. It's generally awkward. These are just words from my interviews. Or, um, and then we get to the separation. That's when the label group is actually seen as slightly less human in nature, slightly more uh, deviant. And then in the end, you have the status loss, which I think we can see clearly is happening to British and Danish officials. So um, I interviewed 123 uh, uh, diplomats, both from Denmark and Britain, but also from other member states and from Norway, which was really interesting. Uh, but then I also had access to archival material, which is also quite a valuable source, because there you can see how much time is actually used to interpret these objects. Um, and then in the end, I also did a stint, a, sh a one year stint in the, in the foreign ministry, working uh, for the preparation of the European Council meetings. That also gave me some insights uh, that uh, has also, but I can't say how much, <laughs> informed the book. Um, so let's see, what do they say? Here's a, 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 a quote from, from the Danish Ministry of Finance. It's an official who represents Denmark. And I asked him basically, can you just explain how, how do you get influence in, in this system? This is very, uh, you know, the core of political science. It's a question of power. And this is what he answers. My experience is that constructive, professional, solid answers to the challenges give goodwill and influence. You can get very far if you argue reason reasonably for a case and have, and this I think is really interesting, no uh, ulterior motives or national interests to be catered for, because everybody can see through that. So what is influence? Influence in the Council of Ministers is something that, ha that, that has to be translated. We usually think of it as voting rights. For instance, Denmark has seven uh, uh, voting points, <laughs> as it were, in the Council, um, and the UK uh, has 24. Uh, then we can count and we can see uh, how much. But actually, this is an argument that you have to translate it into what could be called diplomatic capital, that is a kind of goodwill. You can't really uh, achieve influence without translating those resources. So in the end, the uh, opt-out experience uh, kind of demonstrates that part of having influence in Brussels is also defining what it is. Um, yeah. And in the end, uh, what what happens then? If we go to uh, the, the, the area of asylum and immigration, um, here's a response when I asked a, a French ambassador about, um, you know, how do you see Denmark? And remember, Denmark has opted out, but is still in the room. Le Danemark est non-existant, voilà, oui, les Danois sont polis, mais ils ont, comment dire, un profil bas. Voilà, le Danemark n'a aucune vision pour la politique d'immigration et d'asile. In other words, Denmark doesn't exist. Uh, uh, and you could say, well, that's just a political statement by the French ambassador. We know they tend to do that. Um, but then look at what the Danish uh, representative uh, is saying. Uh, a few months ago, I was at a working group meeting, and I raised a point on a specific issue which needed clarification. Um, France then said, thank you, Denmark, for this comment. It's always good to hear the point of view of someone with an outside perspective. It was so humiliating. And we could then actually ask ourselves, why the embarrassment? Isn't this just a logical you know, answer? Denmark has chosen to be outside. It is an outsider. I hadn't expected when I started doing interviews that you would get these kind of emotions, anger, shame, embarrassment, when talking about something as technical as opt-outs. Um, but it, it, it's part of how officials view their, their roles and how Brussels understands them. Because this is not just a French representative humiliating Denmark, it's a normal state putting the deviant state back into its place. Yet Denmark is still present in the room. The problem, uh, as it were, becomes a much bigger when we look at the euro. Because here, uh, the member states are literally sent outside the door if they're not part of the euro uh, system. Um, this is not just for practical reasons, which I think we always hear, well, that's just easier. But there are also very good reasons um, that the European Commission explains uh, when they were drafting the Lisbon Treaty, uh, here's what they said. We don't want outsiders such as the UK to use disagreement in the Eurogroup to make a big mess. And this is why we expanded the questions that are only dealt with by the Euro area. We want them to feel frustrated. And when we think of this quote from 2008 and think of today, 
we can begin to imagine the kind of things that the Brits are up against now. Um, because basically we have a zone of exclusion. There are big parties celebrated once a member state enters the Eurozone, and only the Eurozone members are invited. Um, but they also only discuss tax issues, budget issues, enlargement. All those things are, of course, dealt with the day before the real, uh, the, the full finance minister meet. So this has real life consequences every day, and increasingly so. Then you can say, well, so what? Well, the interesting thing, I think, is that <laughs> diplomats uh, don't just accept this stigma. They really try to handle it. And I've kind of limited myself to, to present three of these stigma management strategies, as I call them. Um, the first one is definitely the most important one that both Danes and Brits use a lot. That's the compensatory strategy. And we know this from lots of other ways of dealing with, 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 uh, with being, for instance, unemployed. You try to compensate in different ways socially. Um, and so do these. So they, they perceive this idea that they lose influence, but they try to safeguard as much influence as they can. Um, they want to do their job. And I want to stress this is not a, a conspiracy of the pro-European elite against some kind of pop, pop population. It's basically diplomats doing their job. They're supposed to shape as much uh, European uh, uh, in, uh, uh, legislation as possible. Um, this is what they do. They struggle for ca capital in this field. And this might even involve bringing cookies to a meeting, uh, as some Danes were told me. Um, then there's the other one, the missionary strategy. That's only Brits doing that. And that stems from the idea that basically there are good, very good reasons why we opted out, and we should drag the EU in a more British direction. Um, so basically construct another Europe. Um, but the most, perhaps the most striking strategy is the self-restraint or self-censorship. That b is based on a, on a kind of shame that actually uh, maybe we should just remain silent. Um, maybe we shouldn't say anything because uh, this is embarrassing. Uh, it's quite common among Danes, and it also reveals that beyond kind of non-adoption of some policies, it basically obstructs the quest for influence because you feel you have to remain silent. Remember the French, the Danish uh, humiliated diplomat who remained silent. That happens a lot, a lot. So bottom line is, Danes and Brits try to leave fingerprints as much as possible in the global uh, discussions of immigration on the euro crisis, etc. Uh, and they do so with some, with some success, as these compensatory strategies suggest, but not, um, not fully. Um, and we might ask, why do we see these kind of, um, why do we see these kind of strategies in the first place? How, 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 how can it even make sense for anyone to have these strategies? And to do that, we have to ask, what is it that makes them meaningful for these diplomats in the first place? And that's where we get at what uh, Kerbojie would call the doxa, that is the, the undiscussed truth, something we take for granted. And what we take, we, the diplomats, take for granted is the idea that the Rome Treaty basically says, you know, we have to have an ever closer union. Um, it's not said out loud every meeting, but it is a kind of doxic idea. And we can distinguish that from orthodoxy, represented by the European Commission, and some member states like Luxembourg and Belgium. In that light, heterodoxy uh, is represented by opt-outs. Um, doxa is basically uh, uh, to be defended, and that's what the orthodoxy, the guardian of the European interest, the commission does. So each time uh, the member states like Britain and Denmark try to defend or try to maneuver around this, they also actually indirectly help restore the social order because they remind everyone what the doxa is, what is supposed to be the normal way. The diplomatic re repair work that they engage in basically contribute to secure that. Um, and this becomes relevant for our current discussions because if we look at the reactions from other member states, we can clearly see that this doxa is well alive. This is uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, the, the German uh, <coughs> Minister of Finance in his response to, to Boris Johnson's claim that actually you can kind of combine free access to the internal market without um, the free movement of people, which is a core issue uh, 
in the, in the current discussion in, in Britain, of course. And here's his resp response. If we need to do more, we'll gladly send Her Majesty's Foreign Minister a copy of the Lisbon Treaty. Then he can read there's a certain link between the single market and the four core principles in Europe. You'll hear this over and over and over again. Um, I think we need to, when we want to understand how Brexit will eventually end up, we really need to focus on Brussels as well. There's been a lot of focus on the divisions in cabinet, on the two court cases, you know, the question of whether actually Northern Ireland may be the one that vetoes uh, Brexit because of the Good Friday Agreement that is so linked. So the peace in Northern Ireland is intrinsically linked to Britain's uh, EU membership. That's just one issue. The question of whether the parliament gets a vote on uh, the final deal or on the process leading to that. All of this is, is important, but in the end, whatever happens in Britain needs to be negotiated in this toxic environment. Um, not toxic <laughs> yet. Uh, so, so I think that that, that, that really uh, is extremely important. We know now that uh, there's a deadline. We know that Theresa May is going to trigger uh, Article 50 in, in, in spring, no later than spring. And that, of course, clarifies some stuff. But it's also become, uh, I think, clear that we, uh, we or the, 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 the government is extremely divided on, on what kind of Brexit um, they would want. At the same time, and I promise also to say a little bit about Denmark, what happens in, in Denmark is that because of the Lisbon Treaty, the opt-outs have basically grown tremendously. So from being to uh, more kind of um, guarantees that if other member states were to really go ahead with the euro and asylum, et cetera, Denmark wouldn't be part of that. Well, now the member states are going ahead. And what is now happening is that Denmark will leave um, Europol. Uh, and uh, that is basically due to the way the opt-out is constructed. So Denmark will leave the, f the last part of justice and home affairs for legal reasons. Therefore, the prime minister, the old prime minister and s shifting prime ministers wanting Denmark to be part of the heart of Europe have negotiated a copy of the British opt-in possibility on, on justice and home affairs, meaning that Denmark could then have a situation where it could choose from case to case which part of this area they would want to be part of. And we had then in December a new referendum, because that's needed. Do you want this new opt-in possibility instead of just leaving everything? And um, a majority of Danes said, mm, no thanks, actually, no, we don't. Uh, we, we want to stay the way we are. Uh, because they were promised by the Danish People's Party and other parties that they could get instead a parallel agreement on Europol. That is a kind of third country agreement that would kind of repair on the opt-outs but wouldn't force Denmark to be part of asylum policy. However, as you can imagine, in light of the Brexit discussions, this kind of special pragmatic treatment is even more difficult than ever. So the signal from the Commission has been when the new Europol regulation now enters into force in a few, in May, then, uh, you know, Denmark has chosen itself actually twice, you could say, or, or three times with referenda to stay out of this area. Well, so be it. Um, that has to be accepted. Um, so that's where we are uh, in, in Denmark. I don't think there will be a new referendum uh, so far on this issue or in any other EU issue. But this leaves us, of course, with a, with a more kind of general question where, where, and I'm now coming to the conclusion, where are we, how are we to understand all of this? Um, I think these opt-outs tell a more general story about European integration. Um, there is a teleological interpretation of these treaties. There is a kind of sense of direction among most diplomats that negotiate, um, and that does uh, mean something. Uh, there is also a very intense socialization that would happen also in NATO and other uh, international organizations. Um, but there is also um, an interesting twist where promoting a national interest has to be translated into European interest too. We saw that with the Danish official. Um, and that, that does something. So how are we then to understand European integration? I suggest the following uh, way. It's driven by struggles for symbolic power in quasi-autonomous -autonom diplomatic fields 
over particular stakes defined within these fields. And this explains why a referendum is so difficult to translate into this field, because this field is not made for referenda. It's made for diplomatic compromises that are extremely <laughs> complex to make everyone um, uh, uh, agree. So what now? Um, we can say a little bit about what this means for, for Denmark and for the UK. Uh, there is possibility to actually shape influence, uh, and Norway is also an expert in Schengen, uh, doing this very well. Uh, but there are also major differences. The Danish political elite uh, has to, you know, has to manage an opt-out that is decided by the population, not the government, the pro-European government. This is not the case with the UK. The UK had a government that wanted these opt-outs from the very first beginning, and they've been defending that position ever since. Um, and this is important <laughs> for Brexit. Yes, the opt-outs, you, you do lose influence, you do become marginalized, but this is actually seen from the EU perspective mostly a problem for the UK and Denmark, not for so much for the EU. Okay, so it's punished, but the same target norms that serve to legitimize the stigma and position are also employed to reclaim some of the lost influence. But they do not represent in any way you know, that, that line in the sand. That is an illusion. These opt-outs are con constantly reinterpreted and constantly uh, changing and have effects that nobody could even begin to imagine. Um, and that is probably where uh, Brexit also becomes uh, an illusion for many, hoping that somehow you could just opt out and then you wouldn't be shaped by that legislation. Um, so the question is whether we are moving into um, a European onion of some kind. Um, and I think we are. Uh, but there is also, uh, I think, and this is important, there are limits to this. There's limits to how disintegrating uh, Brexit can be as long as there are still so many people defending DOXA. The moment that what we could call heterodoxy or opt-outs, that the British Brexit position becomes the majority position, then the revolution has, uh, has taken place. But that revolution, as I think we can clearly see from the reactions from other capitals, has not yet taken place. And therefore, I belong to the camp that would say, don't, don't, don't overestimate the results of Brexit in terms of the European integration process. It will have huge consequences for Brexit, for Britain, huge consequences for Switzerland, for Norway, or and we can get to that maybe in the Q&A, Denmark. But, um, but there are still states that are uh, deeply uh, wedded to this process and they're ready to fight and even be reminded more now why they fight for this. Um, and they do that because of this. Um, and I wanna leave us with that thought that uh, as, uh, as we're discussing po popular skepticism, um, there is the question we might ask ourselves now that everybody seems to think we are in a big crisis, uh, refugee crisis, et cetera, um, tensions with Russia. Um, and Brexit just seems to be another symptom of this. When, when in, after the First World War, when, when Wilson, Woodrow Wilson kind of had to, exp to find the way out uh, of war, that was more, more multilateral diplomacy. Um, you had the Concert of Europe, you had the, that, that, that he was always thinking of, and then the League of Nations. The Second World War doctrine um, was then, okay, well, actually, we even more, we can't even trust the nation state. We have to bind it more, and I think it successfully did that with the EU, ASEAN, EU, NATO, WTO. Um, and this was seen almost as kind of, to quote Jean Monnet, this was the, the process of civilization. But now, with Brexit, you could ask, is, is this the end of multilateral diplomacy? Is this how far we could get? And are we now seeing a, re, a, a retraction of that? Um, can multilateralism, in a sense, survive new, new Brexits? Um, and I wanna leave you with that question open, but I wanna remind you of, of this social field that is quite strong still and of the ideas that drive uh, diplomats every day, uh, especially when they're not British. Um, thank you.
Thank you so much, Rebecca, for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot of questions, and I will very soon open up for questions from the audience. I'll just, uh, I would just like to mention a couple of points, or, or just raise a couple of points, uh, slash questions, um, that I sort of took from your, your interesting presentations. And the first is about coping strategies, the second is about actors, and the third is about formal membership status. Because in, in your book, you, you've, and, and also in your presentation here today, you talked about coping strategies, and many of these states, uh, and especially these two, choose uh, to compensate for the stigma that is put upon them uh, by not uh, being fully members of, of all these processes. And, um, and I, I, I guess I wonder whether this could be taken as sort of support for the argument that is often presented by Eurosceptics, that basically these elites are, you know, no matter what the formal policy is, they're actually doing something else in Brussels. So it could, in a way, be seen as evidence that they are right in, in arguing that these elites are, are actually compensating when the opt-out is the formal policy. So that would be my first comment or, or question. And secondly, states seem to talk about their opt-outs in different ways. Um, and I was wondering if the states that choose to opt out, are they, do they share some kind of, of identity threats? You, you, you mentioned, you know, the good pupils, the, the, the sort of stereotype of, of the uh, good, good EU member state. I, I was immediately thinking about Germany as, as, a, as an example of, of a country that certainly adapts. And is the phenomenon that you describe, is it a Northern European thing? Do you think? Is it, is it something that is, is more often seen here? Um, so, so who are the states who opt in and who are the states that opt out uh, is, is the second question. And then thirdly, how much of the argument that you make um, relies on formal membership? Um, and I'm of course thinking about Norway here because could a case be made that the Norwegian stigma as an outsider has also led Norwegian diplomats to adopt sort of a, a coping strategy that re resembles the Danish and British ones, but at the same time they're not part of the, you know, they cannot be sti stigmatized in public, so they kind of has, have to be stigmatized in other arenas because they're not in the room. Um, and, and I was wondering, because I know that you have these interviews also with Norwegian diplomats and, and what you make of that. Um, so those would be my two, uh, my three comments. And then I will invite the, the audience to also uh, come with some reactions and, and questions. Is there anyone who would like to go first? Or would you like to respond I can, to? I can respond, then people can think of possible questions. Um, the first one about the elite, is this not just confirming the Eurosceptic view that this is driven by elites um, uh, who don't really listen to the public? Yes. I would say very much. Uh, I think the European integration process is uh, an elite-driven process. Uh, I think that's very clear. Uh, as all diplom diplomacy is, I think the UN is an even more elite-driven uh, process. I think uh, NATO is uh, possibly uh, even more. So, so I think that's in the nature of multilateral diplomacy. Uh, but there is a twist to that, which I also kind of alluded to, which is Yes, it's an elite-driven process, but it respects, uh, I would say, with almost uh, obsession, the decisions of the opt-outs. So you won't, won't find any British or Danish diplomats sidestepping or uh, uh, kind of, you know, tr doing any tricks with these opt-outs. They're totally respected, also by the other member states, because they're legally binding, and it's a legal system. So in that sense, they are very loyal but the question is, as it with all referenda, what is it that people meant when they voted no? So you got these opt-outs that were kind of artificially interpreted, uh, invented, and they then become representative or emblematic of that no, that sovereignty. Um, you have the same discussion now uh, in, in Brexit, uh, where the, the government has a very, the British government has a very paradoxical position saying, well, the only way to respect democracy is uh, by not hearing parliament because uh, democracy has spoken and democracy said, uh, contrary to what they usually say in, in the Conservative Party, but uh, democracy has spoken and has said, it, it has said Brexit and Brexit means Brexit. And then the, uh, the, the alternative position says, well, actually, what does Brexit then mean? It could mean a thousand of different things. 
Um, and that is, that is the real problem. But the real problem here is that referenda really do not work when they want to, to translate these kind of things into binary issues. And you have the situation now that actually, paradoxically, uh, I think we will have the most undemocratic process in, in the UK ever. It's going to be a secret process within cabinet, unless, and even if they get a say, the parliament, most of the process will be intransparent to everyone. Um, uh, and that becomes the representation of the ultimate decision on sovereignty and 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 parliamentary sovereignty, which is so so dear to the Brits. So so there are many paradoxes, but I I, I think it's with the, with with that twist that, that they're very loyal to the legal uh, position that has been carved out. Who else um, <laughs> were the good Europeans? Who are the opt out Europeans? It also depends a little bit from case to case. In these areas, we do have the Brits and Danes that are totally different. Um, but when you look at the euro crisis, uh, Greece became the poster boy for, uh, uh, you know, being the deviant in many ways, uh, to an extreme degree where you could say Italy should have had that label too, or France, but, um, but, but, but Greece was singled out. Um, again, to impose orthodoxy, uh, this time a more German-driven one. Um, but I think countries to really look at now uh, are Poland and the Czech Republic. Hungary, of course, uh, has a <laughs> with Orban has 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 that role uh, to some degree. Also, reminding what we could call core member states or what what European values are, um, but they are they haven't really found their position yet. So some of them are still struggling to to, to appear as I would say core members, and they are also obliged. They don't have opt outs so they do uh, eventually enter uh, the eurozone, etc. Um, Norway is e extremely interesting because the diplomats I've spoken with and I continue to talk with from Norway uh, when it comes to officials or when it comes to Europe, uh, most of them very pro-European, so in that sense they, they, they're kind of like Danes. Um, but they also operate from a totally different perspective because they are outside. So they're kind of kind of what maybe the Brits will become <laughs> uh, one day. Uh, that is trying to influence things from the outside. And that gives you a, a different position. On the one hand, I think it actually makes life a little more diff uh, easy because uh, you don't have to apologize in the same way. You're not a member state. You're just a really shadow member <laughs> trying to adopt as much uh, as you can. And um, uh, on the other hand, of course, it is more difficult because you don't, you're not part of, uh, part of the discussions. Uh, but I do see similar coping strategies. Um, but Norway is also different uh, in the sense that the political elite is more split on, on, on the question of Euro membership or the European Union than, than we have ever been in Denmark. So it's a, again, sovereignty means something even more dif different here in this country is my impression. Thank you. Okay, we have one question from Annie Beth. Sure. Please feel free to, to sign up. Thank you so much for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I, I agree with you that maybe this opt-out and even the Brexit m might not lead to um, complete fragmentation of the integration process. But at the same time, it's a bit worrying that uh, I mean, you see that there could be um, other, I mean, even the, the, the states that are at the core of the integration process, uh, they are affected by this. And they are also not that uh, committed. I mean, the political leadership in France is committed, uh, but not the population. So, I mean, it's not, uh, you could easily see that if uh, we have a, an election in France next year, uh, if Le Pen wins the election, she will also call for a referendum. So, I mean, you, it's, and when, when you see core countries starting to, to talking about various types of opt-outs, it could have some consequences for the for the integration process. So I just wonder if you could say something uh, something about that. Right, uh, that's definitely that scenario, and and we can even enlarge that to say uh, even if Le Pen is only comes in second in the second round uh, of the presidentials, uh, that will still affect French European policy to a large degree because they, that has to be somehow uh, lifted into to, to that policy. Germany as well, uh, yes, a good core country, but um, increasingly Merkel has changed her position as well. 
um, and I'm sure that that what whoever wins the German elections um, will also uh, have a more Eurosceptic position. So you you could say that Brexit has domino effects globally, but also um, and glo globally. I, I do want to emphasize the Russian perspective here. Um, I think the the, the the big victor here <laughs> is uh, of course Vladimir Putin. I mean he. He wanted this to happen, and it's only now that we are realizing how much influence the Russian also played in, in the Brexit debate, um, which could be a topic for for another <laughs> lecture. So, so they're, they're, they're definitely uh, that those effects. And there is a real scenario, I think, if you follow your, to think of, okay, so we have a Le Pen or Le Pen supported or Le Pen dependent uh, French uh, government, and then maybe also a more skeptical position uh, in, in, in Germany, what kind of what kind of process will that be? You know, a return to something that was even before the Rome <laughs> Treaty, so some kind of uh, loose multilateral and non-functioning system uh, eventually. Uh, that is a definite uh, scenario. Um, but I just think, uh, based on, on on what I found so far, that 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 is actually a major revolution. And not just at the level of government, but at the level of the whole way the states have learned to function. They are nation states, but they're also identity-wise <laughs> member states. And that, that has transformed some things. Whether or not that's, uh, I would say, strong enough sociologically to resist uh, these processes, and whether or not that would be democratically a good thing, I think is a different issue. But, but yes, that scenario certainly exists. Um, and you can also enlarge that to the, uh, I think, the uh, Eastern European countries um, or the Central European, the, vi the Visegrad countries are, are something really to look for now because they have ar argued recently that they want to be the mediator between the core and, and Britain, whatever that mediating role should be, um, signaling that there might be a position in between a core and Britain. Again, a more disintegrating process. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rebecca. Um, I was uh, was a really interesting talk, and I was wondering about your concept of social stigma um, that is uh, put on those countries that are kind of deviant within this process uh, when they are opting for opting out. And um, <clears throat> it seems kind of a, like a paradox that um, uh, social stigma is attached to them within uh, Brussels, in the Brussels context, while at home it seems more like a status game that is happening there, where um, their strengthening of national sovereignty is actually a way of uh, maybe achieving pride or uh, strength uh, within a different context. So being divine and being special is uh, in a way a, a strategy of actually um, achieving a higher status in relation to other states. So I was wondering, which way does it actually matter to be deviant um, in the Brussels context when it matters maybe totally different in within the national context? And uh, where do states take this, uh, their position or their, their social status out of this? Right. Okay. That's a that's a really good question and a really difficult one too. So so there's a Brussels scene, but then there's also a different scene at home. Um, that's the organized duplicity of, of opt-outs, basically, uh, where, where they take on a different meaning. They still represent sovereignty for some, for some reason. Um, yes, uh, well, for the individual official representing Denmark, Britain, Norway, whatever, uh, there's not much to be gained by, by that pride at home because they, know, they don't get the, the credit. Though that's only politicians. Um, but they do play that double game. Uh, uh, for sure, and I, I think uh, Theresa May has done that also when she was uh, Home sec uh, Secretary or Secretary for uh, Minister for Home Affairs before she came Prime Minister. You could see she would sell uh, the results one way at home and a different way uh, abroad. So you can, you can, you can, because the two scenes are still so dispersed, you can actually uh, play the, that that game to some degree, uh, but only to some degree, uh, because at at some point these two worlds have to meet, and then the trouble starts. Um, if you think even more externally, uh, it's, I think it's unclear whether this, the stigma of the opt-out can be reversed into an emblem or a badge of honor elsewhere. That's at least uh, interesting to think of. Uh, one of the first things uh, Boris Johnson did after becoming foreign minister was to, to go to Moscow 
and see if uh, he could negotiate some kind of a better relationship. And that would be the beginning of something uh, closer. And he would, he said, normalize relationship with Russia. Um, and whether or not he was wearing his Brexit <laughs> as a badge of honor, we don't know. But that might be uh, possible in, 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 a, in a world where um, anti-establishment, not only at home but also globally, means anti-EU, anti-American superpower, then, then that Brexit position might be turned into, at least among authoritarian states, uh, into something that could be seen as honorable. Uh, my name is Sonne Rand. Thank you very much for your most interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation. And I found the comparison between the UK and Denmark particularly interesting. Um, I would be interested in knowing how you interpreted the State of the Union speech made by Jean-Claude Juncker in the European Parliament on the 14th of uh, September. Uh, did you see any indications uh, with regard to ever, ever closer union? Right. Um, it's funny because uh, that speech has been criticized a lot yeah. for being kind of having no content. He was talking about, uh, you know, he was really ridiculed for that speech, uh, especially for the uh, this argument that <laughs> you, you, you should give uh, so high-speed internet and the young should just have a travel ticket uh, or train ticket and then you know, everything would be fine. But I think actually, to be honest, yes, that speech wasn't, maybe won't go, you know, down in history as, <laughs> as, 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 the, as the, the, the best speech. But if you look at what he's done as a president of the commission in terms of defining projects that are an ever closer union, just think of the uh, five presidencies report on, uh, on what will eventually, if it realizes, becomes a financial uh, union. Uh, he stands definitely for an ever closer union. And I don't think the, the, the State of the Union speech was representative of his position. So I understand what you're uh, saying. So I <coughs> interpret it more as, <laughs> as something kind of weird uh, that didn't really fit with his usual position, which is uh, to be a strong believer in, in, in European integration. And his record shows that that's the, the position he's defending. Also, look at his reaction to, to Brexit that he actually forced, I think, Donald Tusk to come out with this you know, statement you know, the day after, I think, or a few days after the Brexit referendum. Um, we now expect Article 50 to be triggered immediately. Um, this is a person who is very engaged in, in an ever closer union. I have, in fact, two more questions for you. Uh, the first of them is concerning the relationship between the EU and NATO. How do you think that Brexit will influence this relationship, taking into account that Great Britain is an important military power? Right. <laughs> Great question. Um, uh, yes, and something I can say that my own country, Denmark, is really uh, thinking a lot about, given our defense updates. Um, so uh, all of a sudden we see Britain sliding into a position that looks more like ours in this area. Um, yes, uh, I think what we'll see as a result of, 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 of Brexit is more bilateralism. Um, we won't necessarily see those Italian dreams of a, a, a really strong you know, headquarters, et cetera. Some integration, some more integration might happen because there's not that veto player anymore. But on the other hand, there are limits to how far the other member states want to go, including France, of course. Um, so not so much of a big step forward, but some on the pragmatic level. And the relationship between NATO and, and the EU um, will also depend very much on France and Germany. Th those will be the two players now to look for, to understand uh, uh, what used, used to be, you know, just look for Britain and France. No, uh, it's now Germany and, and France that will, will decide the fate of that, together, of course, with, with, with Britain. And, and those states that uh, align themselves or feel aligned like, like Denmark and, and, and Norway to the UK's mm -hmm. position mm -hmm. will probably have a role more and more as mediators uh, between the two organizations. Um, but I don't think that what has been achieved in terms of cooperation in the last five, ten years between the two uh, organizations, despite Turkey and 
will, will really change. I don't think we, I don't think the Brits have an interest in undermining uh, that yet. <laughs> They're not that desperate. And then my last question concerning Article 50, uh, when it will be triggered at some s point uh, n not later than the end of March next year, uh, the question is how the process will uh, continue. And do you think, if you should uh, look into the crystal ball, that there might be a slight possibility that at a certain stage, uh, when people realize that the process will be extremely complex and complicated and will have serious consequences that Britain might think of the possibility of not exiting, even though Theresa May has stated Brexit is Brexit. <laughs> that's that's the, the $100 million question. Will, will Brexit never happen? Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think the process will be very long. Uh, I think what's, uh, what's interesting to see is is there kind of two accounts of, of the process if you ask people in, in Brussels. There's the, there are the kind of the pessimists saying, well, the, the Brits are really good diplomats and they know how to play us out against each other. And what looks like unity and, you know, defending the, the doxa and, you know, no, no uh, negotiation before notification, <laughs> which has been the kind of the mantra, and that, will, that will fall apart and then the Brits will get a really good deal um, quite quickly and because people want to close this and be pragmatic and then everybody else wants that really good deal. Um, that's, that's one story. Uh, the other one is, no, we're going to make this the most difficult negotiation process ever. They're going to, they're going to hate that they ever thought about this and Boris Johnson will, you know, uh, ask himself why he ever defended that idea, um, which is the other version. And, and I think those two are competing and member states haven't really fully, most are now paying lip service to the no negotiation before notification story and, you know, <laughs> staying together. But, but what Theresa May has effectively done uh, is to send people around the capitals, not just herself, and find out what, where are the weak spots. Where is it you think you will lose most or gain most with the special? And that process, of course, if it's successful, uh, will give them some kind of negotiation maneuver. But the other member states are doing the same. <laughs> so uh, we, we are in a situation where everybody's covering each other and trying to think of what, what are our, our assets. And as long as the EU can kind of hang together, uh, you know, the, it's going to take a long time. It might take so much time that you will have a new government. Uh, and that new government might reinterpret Brexit means Bre Brexit means um, a somewhat looser deal that kind of looks like the one Cameron wanted. Um, and in the meantime, other governments might have figured out, well, actually, we also want limits on migration. Because that's, that's the pragmatic solution I can imagine, is that actually a lot of member states, including my own, well, we didn't want free movement of people to undermine the welfare state. Nobody wanted that. So we could still think of, you know, uh, limits or blocks or stuff, things that would count for all member states. If that happens, during this long and tiresome process, then yes, then I could imagine a situation where um, a new government uh, would reinterpret Brexit to be a Cameron Plus deal, but only in that situation. And and uh, and I'm still at the moment thinking more and more that yes, Brexit will happen, but the, the shape of it is uh, even more unclear, I think, than it was just during the referendum. Thank you, uh, Rebecca, for a very good uh, uh, lecture or talk. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I recognize really a lot of what you said about uh, sort of the, the diplomatic reaction uh, to a lot of those things going on now, to the opt-outs, to the Brexit. I mean, uh, from my own experience doing research on Norway, uh, I have experienced when being in Brussels, for instance, doing in research interviews, that people at the Norwegian uh, delegation to the EU have come to me and asked, to join me in meetings and interviews that I got as an independent researcher that they would never get. And of course, all these frustration and compensation strategies. So uh, so that is really something that that uh, might be me facing uh, in the UK as well. Now, I just have two comments. One is from the EU-NATO question that was raised here. I mean, in my research, I think I've seen that 
um, they very much stick to the deal under the Berlin, Berlin Plus, for instance, like you just said with the that there you have opt outs. There are no they stick to the legal decisions. There is really no way you can discuss yourself out of that. And that's what we have seen in the Berlin Plus as well. However, you can always enter into cooperation on new areas. There you have a sort of a new opportunity. Uh, I don't know if that sort of uh, fits into the Brexit thing, but I mean, I think I've seen the same sort of legal, very, very, very strict interpretation there. And then finally, uh, just I would like to say that I, I think you're really good in being so sober about this, what does Brexit mean to the world, sort of. Uh, I mean, there is a tendency that we think that everything is uh, hangs together with everything that you have Russia, you have ISIL, you have refugees, you have Brexit, you have the presidential elections and the world is going under. I mean, seriously, Brexit is one thing. So I think it's really good that you are sort of not uh, interpreting this as one of out of several processes that go in the same sort of negative direction. I, I think that's a good thing to, to do as a researcher. Thank you. Uh, so some of this was more of a com comments, but uh, but uh, but yes, uh, on, on the NATO issue, uh, uh, you know, Britain has always loved bilateralism and has always loved uh, things that are not too formal, uh, at least also in the context of of, uh, of European integration. And of course, they will they will exploit this even more. And the fact that defense policy is still so sensitive and there it requires unanimity. Uh, among the ministers also means uh, that it lends itself extremely easily <laughs> to these kind of uh, agreements. So, so I think we will see that blossoming. And I even think that, that Germany and France will be quite pragmatic about it because they might not also want so much you know, to share everything <laughs> uh, via a, a European headquarters uh, as small, smaller member states want. So, so I could see a kind of a happy uh, seen from the big member states a happy solution to this. The, the losers, of course, will be m smaller member states and those really uh, dedicated to the f a kind of federal idea. Um, uh, so Italy, Belgium, uh, these, these countries will, will really lose out uh, on this. But, but, uh, but I could see Britain thrive in this more differentiated defense uh, <laughs> landscape, as it were, um, where they can pick and choose a little bit more. And might and might be invited in as Norway has has been uh, to participate in some operations. Hi, uh, my name is Yusuf Ergun. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Um, my question is: if the results of the elections in France. And after that, Germany affect negatively EU future. Um, what's your opinion on what might be an alternative for European countries after that EU to continue with small ally groups of countries or every country stands alone or what in near 10 year of period? Thank you very much. Great question. So let's imagine um, that the EU kind of dissolves or disintegrates in light of, of, of a French and German uh, referendum or uh, elections, or at least something happened, what would be alternatives? Uh, the first and boring answer is there is no alternative. And the reason I s I'm saying this is, is, is because something we tend to forget when we're not part of the Eurozone. These countries have the same currency, uh, and they are bound economically, politically, to such a degree that opening up that is not just something you do and then it just happens. It, it's such a deep uh, leap of faith they've taken um, that, that to unravel the Eurozone uh, would require a more than just thinking of like-minded states, etc. You can think of that in terms of some of the other areas of cooperation. You could even think of that in, say, okay, the internal market with all its rules and all its systems, you could imagine that states would then return to just a custom union, as it were in the beginning, uh, with all the costs that would, would mean. But you could imagine that. With the euro, what, what would it mean? Think of Germany. Germany's re unification is based on the euro. The reason why they were allowed unification by Mitterrand and Kohl and to some degree the Americans was that they would give up 
the dearest thing they had, the DMARD. And that, that kind of agreement was part of the, the, the Maastricht uh, negotiations. So you open up so big geopolitical and even I would say identity issues um, that question basically the biggest member states, uh, raison d'etre, namely Germ Germany. How can you how can you even begin that thought? But yes, you would need to, to do that. The moment you say the EU is dead, what what kind of Germany, which is basically based on on European integration, <laughs> is, uh, would you have in that situation? That would be legitimate to other member states, etc. And that's just one one state. Northern Ireland uh, is another issue. How could you keep the peace up there when it's bound into European legislation? Um, Spain, Portugal started out uh, their processes of, of democratization at the same time as they entered European integration. So for many countries, not Norway and Denmark, and that explains a lot, but the others being part of the EU is part of what made them what they are now. And they would need to reinvent themselves totally were they to think of themselves as not EU members. So I love this, the thought, but it's, it's so huge for some member states that it's, it's beyond what we can even imagine. Um, but, uh, but that will need to be imagined. Uh, and the results of that is totally, I think, uh, open if we really were to think no more European integration. For those states, that would mean a new political identity altogether. Makes me also wonder what about the you know the British diplomats. There was a lot of writing after after the Brexit result became known about how how diplomats from from the UK actually had to some of them had to leave their posts and other were sort of forced up in a corner where they no longer have the same room for maneuver. Um, what, what kind of you know stigma is, is put on them when they return to the the British national system or, or find new jobs and and how does this affect their, their their current life in the European Union? Some of them will stay on for at least two years and, and maybe longer. Well, what I hear is that it's a really awkward situation actually, uh, especially in the Commission, because you have a situation where they've all signed this uh, you know I pledge allegiance to the EU interest, and then you have all the British colleagues. Should they be there? listening when when Barnier and his team discusses how to deal with with the UK well they so far they've been allowed to be part of everything which I think actually is quite remarkable given how little uh, Britain wants to share about its 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 ideas so so far it's kind of we're we're pretending and I just was at Brussels one week ago interviewing British diplomats about this and they they continued as if nothing had happened so they were like yeah next we have a working group next <laughs> next week, and we, we want this and this to happen. And and I asked, but you might not be bound by this legislation that you so meticulously prepare for. And they were kind of, you know, I was almost going to say in denial, but, but there is that sense that, which is true, that as long as Article 50 hasn't been triggered and as long as they're members, they're members with all the legal rights. But it's weird. And you've seen it with the commission that that they now have a new commissioner who is responsible for something a little more, <laughs> a little less controversial than, than finance uh, issues. But still, um, I, many say they get the, the cold shoulder and they also engage now in some kind of self-censorship knowing that, um, that the limits to what is seen as legitimate uh, to talk about, what they usually could just you know even have a meaning about um, what's the best monetary policy despite not being part of the EU, they would not be afraid of saying that. Now, you know, everything has changed. Uh, so, so yes, it's going to be really uh, interesting and difficult for them, <laughs> this experience in the coming years. Um, at home, I think they're seen as very valuable because they are in the know and they are so needed for the, the Brexit uh, ministry or whatever the ministry that is now being built up and they need every man on board. So. So there is no stigma there. There's more like, tell us all you know, because it's a very steep learning curve for some, also for some ministers, uh, as it's, it's very clear <laughs> these days. Okay, I have no more people on my list. So let me just take the, uh, the opportunity to thank you again, Rebecca, for coming here and for once again giving us a, a really good seminar, a really interesting, really, really something we could all learn from. Um, your book, 
is available online, uh, so I would strongly encourage you to, to look that up. And uh, thank you all for coming. We also have more seminars in, in this series. You can follow that on, on, on our website, on UP's website. More seminars will be announced uh, later on. So it's just to say um, thank you again, and thank you all for coming here today, and, and have, a, have a good afternoon. <laughs>